Okay, well let's turn in our Bibles then to uh, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. Fairly long chapter, but I'm going to read it all. Come back to this uh, in a little while. Now in the second year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams and his spirit was so troubled that his sleep left him. Then the king gave the command to all the magicians, the astrologers, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. The king said to them, I've had a dream. My spirit is anxious to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made an ash heap. However, if you tell the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts, rewards, great honour. Therefore tell me the dream and its interpretation. They answered again and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will give its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know for certain that you would gain time, because you see that my decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me, there is only one decree for you, for you have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the time has changed. Therefore tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can give me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, there is not a man on earth who can tell the king's matter. Therefore, no king, lord or ruler has ever asked such a thing of any magician, astrologer or Chaldean. It is a difficult thing that the king requests and there is no other king, there, there is no other who can tell it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. For this reason, the king was angry and very furious and gave the command to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went out and they began killing the wise men. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then with counsel and wisdom, Daniel answered Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone, gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He answered and said to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the decision known to Daniel. So Daniel went in and asked the king to give him time, that he might tell the king the interpretation. Then Daniel went to his house and made the decision known to Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah, his companions, that they might seek mercies from the God of heaven concerning this secret, so that Daniel and his companions might not perish with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the secret was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. So Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his and he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's demand. Therefore Daniel went to Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Take me before the king, and I will tell the king the interpretation. Then Arioch quickly brought Daniel before the king and said thus to him, I have found a man of the captives of Judah who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king answered and said to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head upon your bed were these. As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living, 
but for our sakes who make known the interpretation to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your heart you O king were watching and behold a great image this great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you and its form was awesome this image's head was of fine gold its chest and arms of silver its belly and thighs of bronze its legs of iron its feet its legs of iron its feet partly of iron and partly of clay you watched while a stone was cut out without hands which struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces then the iron the clay the bronze the silver and the gold were crushed together and became like chaff from the summer threshing floors the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found and the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth this is the dream now we will tell the interpretation of it before the king you O king are a king of kings for the god of heaven has given you a kingdom power strength and glory and wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of heaven he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all you are this head of gold but after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours then another a third kingdom of bronze which shall rule over all the earth and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything and like iron that crushes that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron the kingdom shall be divided yet the strength of the iron shall be in it just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay they will mingle with the seed of men but they will not adhere to one another just as iron does not mix with clay and in the days of these kings the god of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed and the kingdom shall not be left to another people it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands and that it broke in pieces the iron the bronze the clay the silver and the gold the great god has made known to the king what will come to pass after this the dream is certain and its interpretation is sure then king nebuchadnezzar fell on his face prostrate before daniel and commanded that they should present an offering and incense to him the king answered daniel and said truly your god is the god of gods the lord of kings and a revealer of secrets since you could reveal this secret then the king promoted daniel and gave him many great gifts and he made him ruler over the whole province of babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of babylon also daniel petitioned the king and he set shadrach meshach and abednego over the affairs of the province of, ba of babylon but daniel sat in the gate of the king well let's just pray together shall we gracious god and father we we thank you this evening again for the privilege we have to come and open these scriptures lord and read the things that are written here for our instruction and uh, for our uh, for the building of our faith and and lord so that we might know and understand the times that we live in lord you revealed the secrets of the future even to a pagan king nebuchadnezzar a brutal king at that time i know lord later he came to bow the knee to you he came to believe on you but at this time he was a brutal uh, uh, wicked king a pagan king who did not know you but lord you revealed uh, uh, the truth concerning the future even to him lord how much more would you have those of us who are your children born again of your holy spirit to understand our times to 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 understand what is coming ahead of this time and so father we ask for the help of your holy spirit this evening we realize that without him we have absolutely no chance lord of understanding the times we live in let alone understanding your word certainly not your word because it, these things are spiritually discerned and so we we ask for the help of your holy spirit we pray that you will come and speak to us lord um, uh, your word this night we pray in jesus name amen Oh, Amen. Well, I'm going to come, come back to that passage in a little while. First of all, just a thought I would um, uh, just pick up on um, um, a few things that I noticed in the news just this last week and uh, disturbing things, really. And, uh, and I noticed, by the way, this, this last week that COVID's back. I don't, I don't know if, you, if you've been listening to the news, but uh, it, COVID seemed to have died a death for a while. I mean, I mean it, was, it was the day before the war in Ukraine broke out, wasn't it? And the day that the war in Ukraine broke out, COVID seemed to have gone. 
but it's back covid's back it seems and now they're saying there are more infections i think than ever before or something like that um and uh, so things are on the rise again and it's back in the news so you just better watch out because once they start to talk these things up you can bet that things are going to follow in, in, in a little while so it's being talked up again as uh, and then as of yesterday morning at seven o'clock in the morning parents in the UK in England at least can boot their children aged 5 to 11 they can boot them in for the gene therapy five year old little children as of yesterday morning 7 o'clock or they can apparently walk them into, into a centre and, and, and get them done and that is despite all the information that has come out over the last few months that it would seem the general populace take not a blind bit of notice of you know and yet they're pushing this on five year olds do pray that parents will have wised up to this because such damage is being done you, you know that also and I think this was Wednesday uh, our MPs here in England voted I think it was 215 to 188 to continue allowing mothers to murder their unborn babies at home so called uh, DIY abortions through, through pills and you know and I, and I, and I, was, I was absolutely well I'll be honest with you I was angry but you know what, what, what also struck me about this is that um, 215 against 188 uh, do the maths there are, do you know there are I think there are in the region of 650 MPs in the House of Commons with a right to vote what that means is 200 of them or so either didn't bother voting or didn't even bother turning up for the vote and this is a vote about the lives of little children I mean God that, that, that does not go unnoticed to God this nation is under the judgment of God of that I am convinced and then the war in Ukraine continues which is, which is portrayed of course in the mainstream media in the exact same way as Covid was with, with a one sided narrative only and yet news is coming out regarding the West's provocations in all of this see, see it's portrayed just that you know, you know um, uh, Mr Putin is expansionist and he, he wants to bring Ukraine and Crimea and all of that back under his control it's all about him this evil man but you know, more and more news is coming about about the West provocations of, of Russia and, and of the US financing these bio labs in the Ukraine, capable of producing bio weapons. So, is any country, uh, any leader of any country, going to be happy with those who profess themselves to be your enemy having bio labs on the doorstep? of course not and of course they, at first the US denied it but now they're admitting it and so that's coming out as well as our I mean this is, this is UK taxpayers money by the way as, as well as others actually arming arming um, Nazis like the Azov Battalion and others in, in Ukraine arming them with, with weapons that paid for by yours and my money and then, then also coming out is the disgusting treatment of Russian prisoners of war by those people in Ukraine actually breaking the Geneva Convention actually what, what they are doing but you won't hear any of that in the mainstream media see this is by no means a one sided affair and these are perilous times and, and have you noticed how they continue to speak of the potential of this becoming World War Three? You drop that statement in every now and again. And have you seen how they've included um, 
nations right across the world in this you see maps you know that show these nations are the nations that support Ukraine and these are the few nations that support Russia and it's as it were they, they, they're seeking to get the whole world involved in this and everyone every nation on earth is supposed to hate Russia every nation on earth is supposed to put sanctions in against Russia Interestingly, the US dollar is taking a dive, as is the GB pound is taking a dive and we are starting to see the results of inflation taking, taking place. But from what I understand, in Russia, they aren't seeing much inflation at all, from what I hear. And in fact, the ruble, the value of the ruble is going up because of what Putin has done. So, so you've got to ask yourself, see, what, what are all these things, what is it all about? Well, I would put it to you this evening that what they are trying to do is make this a global issue. All right? Just keep that thought. They, 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 are, they are seeking to make this a global issue. Global issues or global problems require global solutions. Or so we've been being told for a number of years uh, now. Global problems require global solutions. We've been being told that by... Um, you know, the globalist politicians and influential individuals out of the United Nations and the World Economic Forum and various other internationalist globalist organisations. Global problems require global solutions. So over the years, they have been trying to create some global problem or a series of global problems that appear... Uh, to, to they would affect everyone. They would affect not just one nation, but all the nations of the world. Would affect everyone. A problem or problems of such a nature and magnitude that no one nation alone could possibly resolve it. Not even a group of nations, not even the richest nations on the earth could solve such problems but something or some issue that requires that all the nations of the world come together and work together to save the world to save the world for future generations a global problem or problems of such a magnitude they require global solutions it's about globalism so called let me just read you some quotes from this book i have that i think kind of uh, feed into this and uh, i may have read a, a couple of these uh, uh, in a message i brought some weeks ago i can't remember but but um, this was uh, uh, th this was a couple of statements made by um, uh, george bush senior um, around the time of that first gulf war back in the 90s and, uh, and he said, I quote, Now we can see a new world coming into view, a world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. He said the Gulf War put this new world order to, first, to its first test. And my fellow Americans, we pass that test. Today we stand at a unique and extraordinary moment. The crisis in the Persian Gulf, as grave as it is, also offers a rare opportunity to move towards an historic period of cooperation. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order, can emerge. A new era. In other words, what he was saying there about that first Gulf War was, was, was kind of exactly the same as Klaus Schwab said about the Covid um, uh, uh, pandemic. Do you remember? In his book, Covid-19, The Great Reset, he said, the Covid pandemic presents us, terrible though it is, it presents us with a unique opportunity to bring in a Great Reset. Exactly the same as Bush was saying back there. Here's another one. This was Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill. Um, uh, in, uh, in 1947, in a speech he gave in, in uh, uh, Royal Albert Hall, London, 
he said I quote our final goal is to install an all powerful government on a world level and we will strive for that Winston Churchill 1947 here's another this is um, February 17, 1950, a testimony before the Senate on Foreign Relations Committee, international financier James Paul Warburg said, We shall have a world government, whether or not we like it. The question is only whether, whether world government will be achieved by consent or by conquest. But we're going to have it one way or the other, is what he's saying. Former West German Chancellor Willy Brandt declared the following about the planned New World Order. The New World Order is a world that will have one supranational authority that will regulate the world trade and industry. An international organisation that will control the production and consumption of petroleum. An international currency that will replace the dollar. And an international police force to command the decrees of the New World Order is what he said and uh, this is a statement by Nicolas Sarkozy former president of the French Republic he said it's on a global scale that we must consider and resolve the world's problems France intends to pursue with all people of goodwill the battle to bring the new world order of the 21st century peoples of the world together we can build a better world it's built back better this isn't it you know, and this is from 2007 they were building back better then well, at least they intended to build a better world for all mankind in the name of France I call on all states to unite to found the new world order of the 21st century I'll just read one more and uh, this is from uh, <clears throat> the, the memoirs of David Rockefeller. And he said, Some even believe we are part of a secret cabal working against the best interests of the United States, characterising my family and me as internationalists and of conspiring with others around the world to build a more integrated global political and economic structure, one world. If that's the charge, I stand guilty and I am proud of it, is what Rockefeller said in his memoirs. So you see, over the past few years, they have been busy creating global issues, or at least talking issues up, so that they can provide global solutions. Yeah? Climate change, so-called, is, is one of them. The COVID pandemic was another. And we are all aware that regarding these two issues particularly, there is only one narrative allowed in the mainstream media, isn't there? Nobody else can say anything else. There's only one narrative that's allowed. Anyone who questions whether climate change is real or whether it really is, if it is real, a man-made thing, whether it's because, you know, you drive your motor car or aeroplanes fly, flying around in the, in the atmosphere or there are too many cows in the field or what, whatever else it is they want, you know, we eat beef and, you know, what, all, all these things. If anybody questions any of that, well, they're called a conspiracy nut, aren't they? A dangerous one at that. Because, you see, we, we are... We are in its last chance saloon. You know, it has been for the last 20 years, hasn't it? This is our absolute last, last chance to save the planet. You know, so if anybody suggests that what they're saying isn't true, well, you're a conspiracy nut and a dangerous one at that. Similarly, with the whole COVID thing, you know, anybody who spoke against the narrative, well, you're a conspiracy theorist, and we've talked about that much over the last 12 months, of course. And then now we have this war in Ukraine and, and, and what is developing there, including another huge refugee crisis as well as the creation of an energy crisis for certain countries and spiralling costs for others, producing an economic collapse at some stage and food shortages as well as shortages of other commodities. It's all manufactured, all of it. It's manufactured. It's not an accident. It's manufactured. In fact, I, I heard this week... And, uh, and, and by the way, 
what I'm about to say, I have no way of verifying this, okay? I've heard this from, from another source previously, but somebody sent me, me this last week. I've no way of verifying this. So if, there, if anybody knows any American farmers um, that could verify it, I would be very interested to, to hear from them. But, but I heard this week that farmers across America are receiving letters from the government telling them to destroy their crops. And if they do destroy the crops, the government are offering to pay them one and a half times its worth. But if they refuse to dis destroy the crops, then the government will remove the subsidies. They're being advised just to grind the crops into the ground, according to this video that I was sent. And uh, one, one other guy says on there that chickens are being just destroyed and wasted in the thousands across America. In fact, one Texan rancher claims that he'd been ordered to euthanise his market-ready cattle. And you see, if this is true, and again, I have no way of verifying that, but if that is true, then the only conclusion you can come to is that the government are creating food shortages. It's being created. And, and so, you, you, you know, the question that uh, we, we might ask is, well, well, why would they do such a thing? Well, for one thing, you see, whoever controls the food supply controls the people. But it seems to me that this is all about the, the, the ultimate aim of bringing in global government. It's the creation of global problems. Because global problems require global solutions. And you see, we now live in a world that is so interconnected like it has never been before. It's possible now to affect, you know, not just one's own country, but countries across the world with shortages, isn't it? Because it's all interconnected at one time. If we went back, I don't know, 100 years or so or more, you know, but I mean, all the food people in Britain ate was food that was produced in Britain. But now it's all coming from somewhere else. Not all of it, but, but much of it is coming from somewhere else. So, so it's, it's not difficult in this global society to create a global problem. So it's not just shortages here, it's shortages, or sh shortages in the US. It would be shortages across the world, you see. And, and the point is, you see, if you, if you put all these things together, what we see is a deliberate destroying of the old order if you want to call it that. There is this deliberate ramping up of fear. Fear of global catastrophe resulting from climate change. Fear of diseases and pandemics on a global scale. Fear of World War Three. Fear of biological and nuclear weapons. Fear of food shortages and fuel shortages and fear of hyperinflation. And all these things, they say, are global in scope. Therefore, no one nation alone can solve these problems. These are global issues. And global issues require global solutions. What this is, folks, is classic problem-reaction-solution. They create the problem... And then, from the public, they get the reaction they want. And the reaction is fear. The reaction is a cry out, what are you going to do about it? How are you going to solve this? You know, politicians, government, UN, what, what, what are you going to do for us? And so they then provide the solution. And the solution is world government. World government. And the people will say, okay then. You see how it works? It may interest you to know that just this last week they've held uh, in Dubai the Global Government Summit 2022. A Global Government Summit. And uh, the, there have been various speakers speaking on various subjects, but I want to play you now a little video uh, from that summit. And uh, this, is of, this is of a woman by the name of Pippa Mal Malmgren. And uh, you've never heard of her, have you? 
I'd never heard of her, Pippa Malgram. And um, she was uh, one of the chief advisors to President Bush. Her father, it turns out, was an advisor to President Nixon. Remember him? He went down in a blaze of scandal, didn't he? But, it, but, it, but uh, her father, so, so she's from a family of, I think, financial advisors in that sense, at the highest level in, in the US. So uh, I think uh, Ivan's going to put this on for us. It only lasts a couple of minutes. But I, wa I want you to listen very carefully to what this lady says. Try and catch every word she says. And so I think we have to go deeper. And it's not about the US versus China. It's about what underpins a world order is always the financial system. Mm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71. And so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private. But uh, what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether a world order really serves. Okay, so as you can see from what the lady said, it's all about giving everyone a better life, isn't it? I mean, that's how it's presented. It's all about giving everyone a better life. But it isn't really. It's about power. It's about control. That's what it's about. Digital control. Did, did, did you catch what she said? Every single transaction will be recorded. Will be recorded. And make no mistake about this, this is coming. This is coming. The government here in, in the UK, the US government and others too are looking at bringing in what they call a central bank digital currency. And uh, it may be sooner than we think. But when it does come in, it's game over. As, as far as your freedoms are concerned, it's game over. Really. I mean, Hugo Talks called it checkmate. That's what it is. Everything's been moving towards this. It's game over. You see, and, and in order, once that comes in, in order for you to participate in society and what society um, has to uh, uh, offer you, and I'm talking about, you know, the health service, I am talking about the, the, your banking you know, access to your finance, I am talking about healthcare, I'm talking about shopping, in, in, in any shop, in the supermarkets or whatever, in order to participate in that, you would have to be in the system, wouldn't you? You'd have to be in the system. You will need your digital ID. On your phone, probably, to begin with, but then under your skin. And we heard Yuval Noah Harari talking about this with great enthusiasm last week. Do you remember? It's going under your skin. Think about it. Once that comes in, those who refuse to participate will be locked out of the system. Think about it then. Right now, you may be resisting certain things. For example, you may be resisting having the you know what. You don't want to comply with that for your personal reason. And, and there are all sorts of reasons, by the way. People don't want to take that. 
mine has to do with my faith but people have other reasons too okay so right now you're resisting that right now you might be saying I, I refuse to comply right now you may refuse to call a person she who you know very well is a he you, re you refuse to comply with that you refuse you, you know I, I'll be honest with you I wouldn't he can call himself she if he want but I'm not you, you, you know, so I, I refuse to go along with that agenda. And there, there may be so many other things that you refuse to comply with. But what will you do when to refuse to comply means you can't get access to your finance? What will you do then? What will you do when your refusal to comply means you're going to lose your job? What will you do when your refusal to comply means you can't get your health care, will you still refuse? Well, you'll have to decide. I hope the rapture happens first, but if it doesn't, I mean, who knows how much of this we've got to see. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've been preaching on the rapture for donkey's years, me, and I, and I never thought I would live to see the things I'm seeing in the world today. I really didn't. No, I, I, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm just, by the way, I've just been talking about how they're trying to create global problems because global problems require a global solution. I remember preaching that the global problem will be the rapture. That's what I thought. I thought life would just roll on as it was, you know, eating and drinking, marrying and giving and marrying, you know, all, all of that, and then boom, we'd be gone, and then you know, all these problems are out, but we're living through things that I never thought we would see. Okay, so how much more of this we're going to have to endure? I don't really know. So, so, so if this comes in, she's talking about, and others are talking about, you know, you, you're going to have to make some decisions at some point. And you might do well to have a think about it before the time comes. I don't mean to be alarmist. I'm just, I'm just telling you what's what. You know, to, to, to participate in, you know, general life and all the things that we do, you know, you're going to have to be in the system. And to be in the system, you're going to have to have, to have the thing. And if you refuse to comply, you're going to be locked out of it. And, uh, and that's where I'll be, by the way. I'll be locked out of it, me, because I already made my mind up. And so what I'm thinking is, you know, those of a like mind are going to, we're maybe going to have to think of, you know, how we're going to handle ourselves here. Maybe, maybe this, you know, it's time to start thinking about going back to, you know, bartering. You know, you know, I'll give you a box of buttons if you'll give me a <laughs> tin of corned beef or whatever. You know, that, that kind of thing. You know, maybe we're going to have to go back. To, I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud. But you see, you see, this is this is what we're going to be faced with: decisions. Okay, but what I, what I want to think about a little bit this evening. And is, is what the Bible says regarding this coming global government because it is coming you know like Rockefeller said whether we like it or whether we don't it is coming I think it was him no it might have been one of the others but, but anyway whether we like it or whether we don't it is coming okay so I want to think a little bit about what the Bible now I say a little bit because the Bible says loads about it and, uh, and uh, I want us to, to look at um, first of all Daniel chapter 2 now this is not intended in any way to be an exposition of Daniel chapter 2 if anybody's interested in, in studying the book of Daniel well there's lots of good material you can get um, but we did some Bible studies here a few years ago and you'll get, you'll get those on the, on the website um, some Bible studies in the book of Daniel if you want to look at this in any more detail ok so we come to chapter 2 then of Daniel and um, and you, you, you remember what happened in chapter 1, by the way, how, how Daniel and his friends were, were taken to Babylon, and uh, because they were good-looking and intelligent and all the rest of it, they, they were chosen to go into training so that, you know, if they passed all their exams, they'd be able to serve the king, you see. So, so they're taken uh, to his college or whatever it was in those days, I don't know, but, but it, well, they, and they begin their training, and... Uh, and so as, as one of the perks of the job they, they were the king gave them uh, an allowance and uh, provisions for them and th th they were really obliged to receive because this was, a, this was a great privilege however Daniel and his three friends 
um, decided as, as righteous Jews, as faithful Jews, um, that they could not receive this thing. They, they couldn't receive these provisions because to do so, according to the law of Moses, according to uh, the, the, the beliefs that they had in the word of God, to receive the provisions the king was providing, they would defile themselves. If they received that into their body, they would be defiling themselves. And so they asked to be excused from it. And, and they were warned that refusing would put themselves and others in danger. And you know, I, I, think, I, I think I preach one message on this. You know, it's, it's kind of like what's just happened, isn't it? You know, I'm, I'm, not re I'm not receiving the thing because I believe that, well, for, for, for various reasons, but one is I would be defiling my body if I did. So I'm refusing it. But all the time, we are being warned that if we don't receive it, we put ourselves and others in danger and the emphasis being on others because people say oh, I don't bother whether I die oh but you might kill other people so, so it's, it's the same kind of thing in a different sort of a way so they were warned that refusing would get them into trouble and, and actually would put their own lives and others lives at risk nevertheless they insisted and as it turns out God blessed them and they came out the other side in better health than everyone else and isn't that what's happening today too? That the the, uh, the unthinged <laughs> actually actually some people are calling us pure bloods. Yeah, pure bloods. Anyway, we'll, we'll not talk about that. Too. But it, but but you know I I I I firmly believe I have got a better chance of survival than than those with. With, with the uh, they were up to date with the thing yeah. so and anyway so so that's what happened with Daniel and his friends they, they, they came off better and in fact the king was so impressed he gave them a good job in the kingdom okay now soon after this and as we come into chapter 2 soon after this King Nebuchadnezzar he had this dream that, that troubled him greatly you know you, you you know when you wake up in the morning don't you know you've had a bad dream like I, I don't know about you I've said said before when we were looking at the one in Joseph you know sometimes I wake up in the morning I think you know, I can't quite remember what I dreamed but it was a bad one you know and, you, and sometimes you feel depressed for the first half of the day don't you it happens to me you know but that's how the king felt he woke up in the morning and he remembered every detail of this dream and this dream just had such an Im impact on him he thought you've got to mean something this but, but it made it troubled him greatly so, so what he did was <coughs> he called for for, uh, for his his, uh, his sorcerers and his advisors, his magicians and his wise men, and um, to come and uh, and uh, give him the, the the info that he needed, tell him what his his dream meant, and and these these were kind of like the the Babylonian. Um, the, the Babylonian version of the sage committee okay that's so so the, so he called for his sage committee okay and uh, and they were they were happy enough to come and give give the king the benefit of their superior wisdom again just kind of like the government sage committee they must do their ego a great lot of good to, to, to think that they're in this committee of the wisest individuals in the nation to advise the government but, 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 the, but they come along and they're quite happy to offer the king advice the problem they had though was the king didn't want to give them any details if he had they could have just fed the data into their computers and given him whatever projections came out on the basis of the model that they'd already designed. Now, I know they didn't have computers. I know they didn't have computers. But they did have a model. And the model was, you know, if a person dreams this, it means that. And if the person dreams that, it means this. And so they had this model, you see. So if he'd told them what he, any details, they could have just fed the information through their model and given him the projections, eh? But this king said no. You must tell me what I dreamed and give me the interpretation. And if you are as cosmic as you say you are, that will be no problem to you, will it? But they couldn't do it. So the king became angry and he gave the command to start executing them. 
to execute his wise men, or in this case, the not so wise men. See, see nowadays, what happens nowadays, if one of the advisors or one of the cabinet, you know, uh, does or says something wrong, what they do nowadays is just move them sideways, don't they, for a while, you know, till it blows over, and then they bring them back again. But they handled it in a different way in those days. <laughs> if you didn't come up with the goods you're dead <laughs> different times you see different times ok but when Daniel heard and realised his life and the life of his friends was now also threatened because he was amongst the wise men they got together to pray and they prayed that God would reveal both the dream and the interpretation which God did isn't our God great eh? and so, so he, not only give, he gives him the dream, every detail of the dream because God knows everything, you know. He knows even what's going on in people's minds. So Daniel then was brought before the king and he gave both the dream and its interpretation to the satisfaction of King Nebuchadnezzar. And so the dream was of this huge statue. Its head was of fine gold. Its chest and arms were of silver. Its belly and thighs were bronze and its two legs were iron and its feet and toes were partly iron and partly clay mixed man the king was impressed I mean, I mean his own magicians had said nobody could do that only the gods could do that but Daniel gives, gives him every detail of his dream man he was impressed so then Daniel gave him the interpretation you, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and great glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand, and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold, and I bet the king's ego was rise I'm, a, I'm the head of gold. Whoa, you know, I'm the man. So he's so he's pleased with that bit. But after you, oh now the, the king wouldn't have been too too pleased. After after me? What's this? What's this after me? After you shall arise another kingdom. Because he thinks, you see, his kingdom's an eternal kingdom. He thinks he's going to go on forever. By the way, I do wonder about... I was saying to somebody the other week, you know, you know the, the, most of the people who are be, behind the things that are going on today are old men. Have you noticed? And, and so, so the, the question that comes into my mind, some people might you think too much, you Ian, but, but, but like, what, what do they think they're going to get out of it? I mean, I mean, by the time it all comes, comes about, are they not going to be dead? Most of them. <laughs> well, yeah, so, so you, you sort of think, well, if, they, if, I don't know, I mean, if they're atheists... And they think there's no God, no afterlife. No, but what are they going to get at? I mean, I mean, to me, if I were a billionaire and I believed in, I, I didn't believe there was a God. I thought this life was it. I think if I was a billionaire, by the time I got to seventy, I'd go off to the Bahamas or somewhere and get my feet up, wouldn't you? And just kind of enjoy the rest of my life in the sunshine. But these people are beavering away to bring in this new world order that most of them aren't even going to be around to see because they're so old. So that made me wonder, do they think Lucifer is going to give them the reward in the afterlife? can only be that, because I can't see. Anyway, I digress. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then another, a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. Yet the strength of the iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile, etc., etc. He gives the king the interpretation of his dream. And the interpretation was that the head represents the kingdom of Babylon. 
which Nebuchadnezzar was reigning over at that time. It's Babylon. It's the ancient kingdom of Babylon. By the way, this king Nebuchadnezzar was the one responsible for the famous hanging gardens. It was the, it was the same fellow, you see. That's what he's, one of the things he's famous for. So, so the head of gold is your kingdom, Nebuchadnezzar, the kingdom of Babylon. But what God was showing through this vision is that at some stage the kingdom of Babylon would come to an end and be superseded by another kingdom represented by the chest and arms of silver. And then that kingdom would in turn fall and be taken over by another represented by the belly and thighs of bronze which would eventually be taken over by a fourth kingdom represented by the two legs of iron and the feet and toes partly of iron and partly of clay were a representation of the final form of that fourth kingdom you see it's easy isn't it once once you've you've got the interpretation now more students of prophecy and bible scholars are agreed that well we all know the head of gold is Babylon because you know Daniel actually told King Nebuchadnezzar that so the, the head of gold represents the kingdom of Babylon but Babylon actually fell to the Medes and Persians in 539 BC the chest and arms of silver then represents the kingdom of the Medes and Persians which over time just became the Persian kingdom but it began as a kind of double king it was the Medes and Persians and, and so Babylon falls to the kingdom of the Medes and Persians in 539 BC but ultimately the kingdom of Persia fell to Greece to the, the, the Grecian kingdom in 334 BC and uh, Alexander the Great was was the, the king that kind of in lightning speed charged across the world and created this vast uh, uh, kingdom and Persia fell to Alexander the Great in, uh, in 334 BC and then when Alexander died I think he was only about 32, 33 when he died that vast kingdom that had been formed under his leadership was then split into four and four of his chief generals as it were took a, a, a bit each okay so, so then later on the Greek Empire fell to Rome in 146 BC so, so the fourth empire represented by the two legs of iron represents the Roman Empire now of course the Roman Empire ended officially in 476 AD didn't it well did it actually no because, because by then the Roman Empire had already split into two east and west therefore you've got the two legs of iron you see so the, king, the kingdom of Rome had already divided into two and so whereas the western part of the empire had its capital in Rome the eastern uh, part of the Roman Empire had its capital in Constantinople and the eastern part of the empire continued until 1453 AD when it fell to the Ottoman Empire so, so these then are the four kingdoms four successive kingdoms shown to Nebuchadnezzar in the vision of his dream and by the way the same four kingdoms are described in more detail actually in Daniel chapter 7 um, so let me just read some verses from there <clears throat> so picking it up at um, verse 2 Daniel spoke saying I saw in my vision by night and behold four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea and four great beasts came up from the sea each different from the other the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings I watched till its wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it and suddenly another beast a second like a burr it was raised up on one side and had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth and they said thus to it arise devour my much flesh after this I looked and there was another like a leopard which had on its back four wings of a bird the beast also had four heads and dominion was given to it see the the, the leopard is 
is Alexander and the four heads of the four generals that his, his kingdom was divided up into after his death, you see. After this I saw in the night vision, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. It was considering the, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one coming up among them before whom th three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched till thrones were put in place and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousand ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him the court was seated and the books were opened I watched them because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame as for the rest of the beasts they had their dominion taken away yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven he came to the ancient of days and they brought him near before him then to him was given dominion and glory and kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, <coughs> and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to one of those who stood by, and I asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made known to me the interpretation of these things. Those great beasts which are four are four kings or kingdoms which arise out of the earth. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Forever and ever. Then I wished to know the truth about the fourth beast which was different from all the others, exceedingly dreadful with its teeth of iron and its nails of bronze, which devoured, broke in pieces and trampled the residue with its feet and the ten horns which were on its head and the other horn which came up before which three fell, namely the horn which had eyes and a mouth speaking pompous words whose appearance was greater than his fellows. I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came. And see what chapter 7 is doing is telling exactly the same story as Daniel chapter 2. It's just giving more detail about these four kingdoms and particularly the last one. Now as I say this is not meant to be an exposition of Daniel. You can find uh, more, more detailed Bible studies on our, our website if you want. Okay so what, 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 what this is is, is, is a simple matter of history. It all came to pass exactly as the Lord had said. Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians. The kingdom of Persia fell to Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire. That fell to the, to the Roman Empire. It's simply a matter of history. Because you see, whatever the Lord says comes to pass exactly as he says. There is no margin of error in the word of God. The prophets didn't engage in guesswork. You know, I mean, think about it. How could Daniel possibly know, you know, what would happen hundreds of years hence and the rise of the Roman? I mean, how could he possibly know that? And I'll tell you something this evening. That's one of the reasons that unbelieving liberal Bible scholars put a late date on the book of Daniel. They say it wasn't written by Daniel at all. It was written by somebody later on who, who said it was Daniel. But the reason they say that is, how could he possibly have known? And especially chapter 11. I mean, the detail in there is just unbelievably incredible. And they say, well, the person who wrote that must have known his history. No, he didn't. He received from the word of God history in advance, you see. What, whatever God says comes to pass exactly. And listen... You know, one of the purposes of these talks is to talk about things to come. And so, just as Babylon fell to the Medes and Persians, Medes and Persians fell to the Greeks, the Greeks fell to Rome, and it all came to pass exactly, so will this final development come to pass of this fourth kingdom. What is it? It's going to be the kingdom of the beast, you see. So, so what I want to draw your attention to now is, is this final form of the fourth kingdom, described in chapter 2 as feet with ten toes of iron and clay. 
and then in chapter 7 described as ten horns out of which another little horn rises up they both describe the same thing and it, it's the final form of this fourth kingdom and is in fact the final form of human government and empire if you look back across history there have been many empires hasn't there Egypt, Assyria, you know, Babylon Medes and Persians you know, Greek, Roman then, you know, if you, if you carry on after Bible times you've got you know, the British Empire and the Ottoman Empire and all these other them. But, but that isn't going to go on forever because there is going to come one final form of human government and human empire and after that it's over it's over so, so this, this, uh, these ten toes in chapter 2 and the ten horns in chapter uh, 7 are describing this final form of human empire on earth that is yet to come because what both chapter 2 and chapter 7 show us is that in the days of these kings as it puts it in Daniel 2 verse 44 the ten kings will ten kings will rule during this final kingdom the God of during that time the God of heaven it says will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed and in fact it will break into pieces and consume all the other kingdoms that went before it and in chapter 7 it describes it well I've, I've just read it it describes what will happen okay so what is this what is this final kingdom then and who are these ten kings and who is this described as a little horn who comes up among the ten with eyes it says and a mouth speaking pompous or blasphemous words Daniel 7 verse 20 whose appearance it says is greater than his fellows the other ten and who makes war with the saints and is allowed to prevail over them for a short time well the answer of course is found in Revelation chapter 17 where it says in verse 12 the ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast these are of one mind and they will give their power and authority to the beast and, uh, and I would say and I doubt any of them listening to my talks but if any of them do I'm talking about the politicians and leaders of the governments of this world today who are making all these draconian laws like Trudeau in Canada and what he's doing to his own people what they should realise is that that they are given power for one hour in other words the days are numbered you ain't going to be around forever and if you take my advice you'll repent Amen. because something's coming okay so, so the people we are talking about here the ten kings to come are ten rulers who will rule for a short time and interestingly it says there they will give their power and authority to the beast to the man who is to come who the little horn who will rise up amongst them and rule over them to him and to his kingdom because the beast is a man and it's also a kingdom they'll give their power and they'll give their authority to him who's supplying weapons to the Ukrainians now well they would say NATO wouldn't they well, we pay for them so how did NATO get our weapons we give them to them and if there's some trouble spot in the world and the UN decides to send UN troops who are those people who go well it all depends where the trouble is if it's an African country they usually send African UN uh, uh, um, soldiers if it's somewhere say in Europe there might be the British military might be, might be amongst them using weapons paid for by you and me so what's going on there we are giving our power over to some other organisation, do you see? 
to the UN, to NATO or wh whoever it is. We are giving our power to them. But you see, what they do is they don't just give the weapons to the beast, they give their authority to him too. So in times past, the people who made the decisions, at least on paper, who, ma who made the decisions and passed bills that affected the people of the United Kingdom were the duly elected poly uh, MPs and so on who, you know, passed bills through Parliament and all the rest of it and enacted them. Okay, but increasingly... That authority is going away from Westminster, if it ever had any authority in the first place, and it's going, and it used to go to Europe, didn't it? But we've joined out now. But, but it doesn't matter, because ultimately it will go to the UN, or whatever the final form of that is. In other words, authority is passed to that too. So decisions that come at that level supersede anything that happens at a national level. It's the ultimate author. It's, it's the power that those people whose quotes I brought at the beginning want to bring in. This supranational power that is coming. And so, so the little horn that rises up amongst these ten leaders, he's the Antichrist who is to come. He's the beast. He's the Antichrist. And, uh, and it says that he, he, in appearance, is greater than his fellows. And what that means, you see, is that in every way, he's head and shoulders above the rest. And you know, I've, I've often said, if you look at the politicians and statesmen in the world today, I don't mean any disrespect, but they're pathetic, aren't they? I mean, I mean if, if, if you compare them, for example, with some, and there aren't many, but some great statesmen of the past, whether, whether good or evil, by the way, whether good or evil, they, they just don't compare. I mean, I mean, again, you know, go back to the seven, the Second World War. You know, and whatever you think of Churchill, the fact is that when that man gave a speech, the way that he did it, he was able to to raise the morale of the nation. Wasn't you know, whatever you think of him as a person is irrelevant. He could, he could command. A, the, 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 the people of this nation to listen to him and to rise to what he said alright that's a statesman and, uh, and whilst I don't in, in any way shape or form applaud Adolf Hitler at all but what you've got to understand is when he stood on that podium in front of the masses of crowds and you've seen it you know and the Nuremberg rallies and he gives his speech and I tell you, there's something demonic going on there. That's, that wasn't natural. There's something demonic. But you've got to, you see that man and you see that he is someone who, demonic though it is, is able to command the attention of his people and get them to do the most evil and vile things. And that's a statesman. But the people we've got in the world today, that, I mean... Pfft. But you see, the point is this that when Antichrist comes he will be so obviously head and shoulders above the rest of them and when he speaks it will be like Hitler from that podium and, uh, and when he brings a speech it will be like as inspiring as one of Churchill's because he'll have that charisma he'll have that power and, uh, and in appearance he is greater than his fellows, it says. In other words, he has no equal. As a politician, as I'm not congratulating him, I'm not praising him, I'm just telling you that's what he'll be. Now what's interesting is that um, it, also, um, it also says here, and uh, I was kind of wonder about that, he says he has eyes. Do you notice that? He, he has eyes, it says. In Revelation um, chapter 7 and verse 8, um, it says, Therefore the male... Oh, sorry, chapter, wrong chapter there. Uh, chapter 7, verse 8, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up amongst them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes, like the eyes of a man. And then in verse 20... And the ten horns that were on its head, and the other horn which came up before which the first three fell, namely the horn which had eyes, and a mouth speaking pompous words. You think, well, if he's a man, he's, 
He's got eyes. But do you know, I thought about this. I thought, I think it means more than that. I think it means that he is able to see what's going on everywhere, in a sense. It's about surveillance. And he's able to know what all his subjects are doing. What they're buying, what they're selling, where they're going, where they're travelling. He's able to he's able to see all that. Not that he himself sees it, but by means of artificial intelligence and by means of algorithms and by means of the digital technology that is in place, he can track everyone. He sees. You see? And it also says that he has a mouth speaking blasphemous words. And so, so in, in uh, 2 Thessalonians and uh, chapter 2, speaking about the same individual, verse 4, says he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So in other words, he claims that he's the Christ. He's the saviour of the world. He's God. Well, that's utter blasphemy, isn't it? But that's what it is. Now, the interesting thing is that in describing the beast's kingdom, this final form of human government, Revelation chapter 13 and verses 1 and 2 seem to suggest that there, there is in it all the elements of all those kingdoms that Daniel spoke about. Because what it says is, I stood on the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a burr, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Can you see? There are elements of all those other kingdoms, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, all the, the elements of, are all in this final form of human government. It has, it has elements of all of them in it. This, then, will be the ultimate kingdom of man, of fallen man. And six is the number of man. And of course, you all know the number of the beast is what? 666. It is the final, the ultimate form of human, fallen human government and empire. The man who rises up to take control of this kingdom takes control of a global kingdom. He controls a kingdom that spans the earth. And he has at his disposal the power to see where everyone is, where all his subjects are, who they're with, what they're doing, what, where they're going, everything. He has the power to see what they are buying, what they are selling, but he has more than that. He has the power to control it all through digital surveillance and through a digital technology which the people have gladly received. Why? Because global problems require global solutions and the solution is the thing that they give everyone. And that thing is a digital technology. First of all on your phone, but afterwards under the skin. And already we live in a world where people don't have a problem with that. In fact, they willingly receive it. Because over the years, they've been making it all as attractive as possible. Hey, everybody, I mean, I remember when I was a kid, we didn't even have a telephone. <laughs> and then my parents, I think I might have been about 11 or 12, my parents got a phone. And um, remember Party Line? <laughs> you pick the phone and neighbour was on the phone, you know. And then, and then we got our own line. You know, and, and it's like, amazing, you know, we had a phone in the house. But to think that now, you know, well, it, it, was the, it was the 90s, wasn't it? Mobile phones came in and it was like a brick, remember? <laughs> and, uh, and, and when people who had them, you know, yuppies, you know, they had, they had this phone everywhere where they went. 
and then the phone got smaller and smaller and smaller and now it's not a phone at all it's a computer you're carrying around in your pocket a computer so when when people have nothing to do when they're sitting on the train they can play the computer games or they can do or they can surf the internet and everything all on the phone and so they've made it this super attractive thing that everybody wants but you know it'll become your ball and chain you know but when when it when they say oh you, you, you know you can lose your phone I mean I've been in the supermarket and people pay with the phone they pay with the phone but see, the problem is you can lose your phone and what if somebody what if somebody nicks your phone and you've got all your details in there ah but we've got the problem we've got the problem solved you can have it under your skin now you've got everything everything under your skin they're not going to cut your hand off are they you know and, and if they do you can make the technology so that once you cut the hand off it ceases to work it dysfunctions yeah. or you could have it in, the, in your forehead if you wanted to see and, and you see what our, what our forefathers in the faith couldn't understand when they read Revelation 13 the end of it about controlling people buying and selling and that with a tattoo with a mark how are you going to get all the world to have a tattoo but it isn't a tattoo it's a technology and it's coming in folks in fact it's here now global problems they say require global solutions and so what they're doing is they're bigging up the problems so that everyone fears and so when they say the problem's simple, the, the answer's simple. You know, we need a global government. And people say, okay, well, well if that solves the if, if that sorts out the wars, you know, if we if we if we have if we have the UN and their subsidiary, the World Health Organization, they can deal with all the sicknesses and the pandemics and the problems. That's wonderful, isn't it? You know, and we we can have other organizations that you know, yeah, we'll we'll have that. Sounds like a great idea. Oh, but by the way, you know, there's food shortages. So we're going to have to ration food. Well, back in the Second World War, you had a card. But you don't need that anymore. If you've got the technology, you just have your ID on there. And they'll be able to tell you just how much you can buy each week. And they'll tell you what you can buy. And you know that they, they want everybody to stop eating meat, don't you? So with the digital technology, you can tell people what they can buy and what they can't buy. And if meat is off the menu, you ain't going to be buying any meat. And whoever controls the food supply controls the people. Can you see what's happening? This is our generation. This talk is called the push towards global government. And that's what is happening today. Well... As I said before, they needn't have wasted the time trying to create a global problem because very soon they're going to have one, a real global problem. When every born again believer in this world, all over the world, suddenly disappears, they will have a global problem, won't they? When the rapture takes place, and all those millions of people are suddenly gone. Imagine the chaos. But the chaos called by the rapture will just be the beginning of sorrows. Because then starts the tribulation. And if they think climate change is a problem, well, then they will know it is during the tribulation. They just need to read Revelation to see what climate change looks like. But it's all under God's control. And what it tells us in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 is that at the, the end of that short period, Jesus is coming back. And guess what? I'm coming with him. I'm coming with him. And so are multitudes of other believers coming back with him. And then he will set up a kingdom that no other kingdom will follow. It won't be superseded by the Medes and Persians or the Greeks or the Romans or anybody else. It's a kingdom that will last as long as this planet lasts. And that will be for a thousand years. Jesus will be on the throne and we will be reigning with him if we're saved. 
but what about after the thousand years well God's going to wrap this universe up it's all going and then he'll replace it with a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness alone dwells no sin, no sorrow no sighing, no death nothing adverse at all only joy everlasting in the presence of the saviour but to get there you've got to be righteous and the only way you can be righteous is through faith in Jesus Christ who died to save you from your sins who died to cleanse you from your sins and for those who believe God imputes to us the very righteousness of God himself meaning that we can dwell forever in his kingdom God's in control and Daniel discovered that well I think he already knew it but when he prayed with his friends what did he say you raise up kings you put them down you raise up kingdoms you put them down the times are in his hands not Boris Johnson's or the United Nations or whoever else there is the times are in God's hands Father we thank you this night for the privilege again to be able to open your word and to read these things and remind ourselves of the things that are coming Lord right now we're living in trouble sometimes perilous times but Lord I thank you that at the end of it all Lord we're going to see Jesus Lord sometime very soon we're going to be taken those of us who have faith those of us who believe are going to be taken to meet him in the clouds to meet him in the earth and then we shall forever be with the Lord it says but we're coming back with him and he's going to set up his kingdom Lord all the kingdoms of, of man with all the pomp and all the, the pride Lord it's all coming to an end your word says that it'll all be ground to powder and Jesus will reign supreme Lord how we long for that day Lord help us Father God in the time that remains to us Lord to honour you and to glorify you in all of our life we pray in Jesus name Amen